All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 22 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast, 20 minutes with some of the world's top fitness professionals. I'm your host, Anthony Randa. You can check out the show notes at stop20podcast.com. That's stop20podcast.com. Make sure you go to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Please leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. I know I say it every time, but it, it really does just to get the word out there. All right, for today's episode, I have on Sue Falsoni, and Sue is a board-certified clinical specialist in sports physical therapy, a certified athletic trainer, certified orthopedic manual therapist for the spine, as well as a certified strength and conditioning specialist. She worked at Athletes Performance for 13 years. That's where I met her a long, probably 12 or 13 years ago. Jeez. She holds the distinction of being the first female head athletic trainer in any of the four major sports in the U.S. She was working with the Los Angeles Dodgers for six years. She was last serving as the head athletic trainer and physical therapist. She also serves as the head athletic training and sport performance uh, with U.S. men's soccer national team. She likes yoga and drinking wine in her spare time, sometimes together. Sue, thanks for coming on today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Anthony. It's very true. Sometimes those things go together. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should say namaste. Namaste. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sue, let's get right into it. Uh, what's your story? What's that fitness, what's that spark of your early fitness lifestyle? That, yeah, that, I love this question. You know, I was someone who grew up in the water. I think I swam before I walked. Um, and so I have vivid memories of like being in swim lessons and being at the pool all the time. Uh, granted, I know I grew up in Buffalo, so there's not much time for the outdoor pool. Uh, but as soon as it was warm enough to get out there, I was in the pool. And so actually a lot of people don't know I did um, pretty competitive synchronized swimming from the ages of seven to 14. Um, and then I know, and then I tried out for this national team, which I made and literally quit before our first practice because I was going into high school and, uh, realized there was all these other things I could do in high school other than just swim. And so, um, Needless to say, I wasn't a very good athlete across the board uh, because I spent my formative years in a pool. So I really have no fast twitch muscle fibers uh, in my body at all. <laughs> and eye coordination is not fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I can I can swim like a fish, which is which is great. But uh, so ever since then, you know, I've just always kind of been active and in the pool. That's my favorite place. Um, and have worked really, really hard at all other types of fitness from then on. It's interesting, you know, again, like you said, being from Buffalo, that uh, you were such a, a fish, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it just was nice and warm in there. I always hated skiing. Well, we never went skiing, but I just hated being outside in the cold, so I never wanted to go skiing or snow sledding or anything like that. I just hated it. I just wanted to be in, like, warmth. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Um, was was there any was this being in the pool at that time? Was that the fitness for you, or was was there any like kind of you know uh, dry land training? Yeah, you know, dry land stuff really didn't come into play. I, I almost would say, at least, I mean, I played soccer in high school. Um, I tried other sports in high school just because I wanted to be active and wanted to do stuff. I was horrible at all of them. Um, I got most improved player, you know, on the soccer team in high school, if that's any indication of how bad I was. <laughs> Um, and it really wasn't until, um, probably after grad school, which I know sounds really, really pitiful, um, that, and once I kind of moved out to Arizona that I really started sort of getting into fitness, like for fun. Um, and then once I started working at athletes performance, uh, I worked a lot with Luke Richardson and, and, uh, Luke is the head strength coach for the Broncos. And he is really the one that like taught me weight training, um, and taught me like weight training for fun and kind of made me stop doing the whole, 
I'm a girl and want to be skinny thing. He was like, that is an unrealistic goal. Like you're never going to, you know, most girls are never happy with how they quote unquote look. Um, he's like, you need some tangible fitness goals. And so we started working on how many pull-ups could I do? How much could I squat? How much could I deadlift? And sort of, he's really the one that got me into these, you know, sort of objective fitness things that sort of go above and beyond body comp, which was really, really needed for me at that time. And, um, yeah, I kind of attribute my, my time at AP and my, my time with him and some of the other coaches there, Daryl Leto, same thing. We would just, um, who's now he's a head strength or one of the strength coaches for the Oakland Raiders. And so same thing, he would just teach me a lot about movement. And so we just kind of really ran and did different stuff. And that's kind of when I got into it, which seems really, really late. I know, but yeah. that's and it's interesting it. that you even ended up, I mean, it's for another podcast, but it's interesting that you even ended up at AP without kind of that background of at least understanding or, you know, kind of being into that a little bit. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I had a lot of experience working with athletes at Carolina, but I mean, it sounds ridiculous because when I hear that, you know, Barack Obama can work out every single day and he, you know, how busy was he as the president, you know, and then I look back in times in my life where I was like, oh, I'm just too, was too busy to work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, but I, I, I unfortunately think that's part of what it was, was when I was in undergrad and grad school, it just, I, I felt like there was no time to do much else other than work and sort of try to have fun mixed in there every once in a while. And so, yeah, it was, I really kind of got into fitness rather late in my life, I would say. Yeah. Um, well, growing up, who was the person, who was that superhero for you? Who influenced you the most kind of to become who you are? Yeah, I, I think the, the caveat to that question is we were sort of talking beforehand um, is to come up with someone who are not your parents because my parents were definitely uh, that role for me. But sort of beyond them, um, you know, my Aunt Marie, who is my dad's sister, she was always such an interesting um, person to me. First of all, she was really sort of the only one in the family that lived away. She had lived in Philadelphia and I lived in Buffalo, obviously, as, as well as everybody else. And she was that woman who owned her own business when she was younger, you know, in her twenties and she had moved away to Virginia, which, you know, in the thirties and forties and fifties in Buffalo, New York, like that's unheard of, you know, her parents had come over for, from Italy. So, you know, she was first generation and, you know, for her to move away and start her own business like that as a female at that time was really not a common thing. Um, and she, you know, was in it as we are, my family's Italian Catholic family from, from Italy. And she met and fell in love with a Jewish man in the, in the forties and fifties and, um, probably in the forties actually. And so she converted to Judaism, which again, for an Italian Catholic woman at that time to convert, um, you know, her faith. So, you know, in such a different, manner at that time was again, a huge deal. And so I think that Aunt Marie was sort of someone who just always did her own thing. Um, always followed her heart, always did her own thing, always did the difficult thing. And, um, that just really stands out for me as someone who, you know, I was able to sort of have available to me growing up, which is kind of neat. Absolutely. What a badass in those yeah. times, man, I can totally um, relate. Jeez. Um, yeah. So what about now? Because you've been surrounded, and I know I say this, I've, I have so many great people on this show, and but everybody's surrounded by so many amazing people. You you teach a lot, you attend a lot of different lectures, you're, oh, you're, you're, you give a lot of lectures, you've worked with so many amazing people. Who do you look up to now? Who's your superhero right now? Oh gosh, yeah, right now, that's that's a tough one. And, and I don't mean to, to go back to like, the easy question of saying your parents, but like, you know, my mom is someone I really look at. She's just been through a lot, you know, dad passed away 12 years ago, I think, you know, and watching her take care of him and really sort of living, you know, in sickness and in health and sort of what that means. And, um, she's had a lot of, uh, a lot of health issues of her own over the last year. And, you know, she just kind of keeps getting up and just keeps doing her thing. And so, you know, I really look to that, um, as well as to kind of, as a continued reminder, I'm definitely, as so many of us are, are the type of person that can just get really wrapped up in work, you know, and really not, not on purpose, but kind of forget sometimes about family and friends and, um, 
not forget about them, but you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I can't go to lunch with this person because I've got to do some work or I can't go home to Buffalo to visit my mom because I've got to go all over the world to do other things, you know? And it's, she's kind of just someone that sort of keeps bringing me back to reality to sort of say there's more in this world. There's more in this life. Kind of keep, keep grounded, be still, be, you know, be present. And, um, is someone that I just continue to kind of, kind of look at right now for, for strength in a lot of different ways. Love it. Yeah, we all need those. We all need those reminders, too. It's good stuff. Um, what about, so you have, you know, last couple of years, you've kind of gone out on your own. You've done, you have like such a great resume. You're doing your own thing right now. Who are you trying to be a superhero to? Who are you trying to reach with, with your message and your business? That's a great question. I think, um, you know, there's there's an obvious answer here, I think think with sort of the, the young female, um, people, I'm, I'm just, I'm so lucky at the number of letters and, um, emails and social media messages that I get from women, um, that are just so cool. I mean, I'm thinking about one girl in particular, I've stayed in touch with her. The first time she emailed me, she was 14. Um, she was just leaving eighth grade and she was like, she said, I want to, I want to do professional sports and athletic training. And she literally wrote the stupid boys in my class keep telling me that I can't do it because I'm a girl. <laughs> and, and so I Googled, you know, I Googled whatever, and your name came up and she goes, so I showed them your website and told them that I could do whatever I want. And so now this girl's a senior in high school. I keep in touch with her. She's going to an athletic training program. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's so cool to sort of, I really sort of thought that whole thing was going to be kind of a 15 minutes of fame thing and just be done. And it's amazing how three years later, I'm still just getting these awesome, awesome emails from young women saying, I was told I could never do this, or I was told to pick another option or, you know, even some other, you know, older women who have said, yeah, I, you know, 20 years ago I was in the field and they told me to beat it. Like, like that a female was never going to be accepted in this world. And, um, you know, the, the fact that I can bring any sort of hope, I think, um, cause I always tell people, it's not like I'm the best physical therapist or athletic trainer in the world. I mean, I think I'm good at what I do, but it, you know, it was all about timing and I was in the right place at the right time with the right organization and the right situation. And so, you know, voila, this thing has sort of been bestowed on me as the first. And, um, it, it's amazing at how a lot of people have really, gravitated to that. And so if there's any sort of hope that I, I just, I'm amazed as I told you about my story about Aunt Marie, I have so many examples of positive women like that in my life, um, that I feel so lucky over. So if I can just be that positive experience or that positive person, um, or a positive role model in any way, shape or form to, to up and coming young women, I, I think that's, that's really, really huge. That's um, awesome. yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I think it's cool that she Googled stupid boys and your name came up, but, um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Sue, let's segue that into, you know, you've been in this business for a while and you've obviously seen, um, what's been some of the challenge for you? There's had to been some challenge, some challenges too, as well, being a woman in that industry, working in sports, what's been like from the start to like right now, some of the, you know, the challenges you've had, some of the great things that you're seeing. Yeah, I think we're seeing so many more women in positions of, uh, of leadership in athletic training, physical therapy, and sports medicine across the board and strength and conditioning, which I think is amazing. You know, it's nothing for high school students to have a female in their athletic training room or, or a female strength coach. Um, and that's translating into the collegiate world as well. Like there's so many fantastic um, collegiate strength coaches and, and athletic trainers and physical therapists. And so, you know, I just think it will continue to change as these people are getting, these athletes are getting older and then they move to the pro level again, it will not be a big deal. So I just think this natural evolution of, you know, more women in the field, more women being present, um, and realizing that, you know, uh, they can do a great job in those situations. Um, is, is really neat. And, and we, we've seen this, this shift and this trend over the last few years, and it's just going to continue to shift, which will be wonderful. Yeah. So you read so much and I know you're usually reading like these huge volumes and you're writing a book right now. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but 
Have you read any um, non-fitness related books lately? And if you did, tell yeah. us a little bit about it. Yeah, the the last book I just read was, uh, well, I always usually have like three books going. I always have like a murder mystery, f- complete fiction <laughs> thing going, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then I always kind of have a business book going. And then I always sort of have like something spiritual going as well. And so, you know, I think the last sort of business, I guess, book, I would say was the Talk Like Ted book. Um, which as I'm getting older, I'm having a hard time being concise, (laughs) meaning (laughs) I have a really hard time talking about things for 20 minutes. You know, I just spoke at a conference this past weekend and, you know, I had 20, 25 minutes and I'm thinking, there's no way I can talk about this topic in 25 minutes. Like it's such a huge thing. And so just sort of learning how to get my point across in a short little burst, like this, like this stuff, 20, 25 minutes. I mean, people's attention spans are getting smaller and smaller um, as we have more and more information coming at us. And so that's really kind of what the talk like Ted book talked about was sort of how to get, how to be concise, how to get your point across, how to be a good storyteller, um, and how to be an effective speaker, you know, without having to be up there, uh, you know, for two hours and having people feel like they've got a, how do you get people to relate to you right out of the gate? So I, yeah. for me, it's a really powerful message right now. And it's incredible because if you think about, or if somebody like me is listening, I've seen you speak many times and you're an amazing speaker, but you, you know, you're sitting there still saying, I can't be concise. I need to cut it down. And, uh, it's interesting the way we kind of put these, uh, you know, demands on ourselves. And, and yeah. but, but you're right though. I mean, the attention span has gone down, so yeah. it is important to try that, but, um, good stuff. All right, Sue, now it's time for the stop and give me five segment, five rapid fire questions and answers. You ready to go? Ready. All right. You've been all over the world with this stuff. Uh, coolest teaching experience. Actually might've come after this weekend. Uh, I was teaching at the San Francisco Giants um, sports medicine conference up in San Fran this past weekend. Um, and I got an email from one of the participants Saturday night that, you know, I spoke on alternative therapies in rehab, which is a really strange topic when you're on the docket with a whole bunch of surgeons and other clinicians who are very, were being very peer reviewed journal oriented. I just had a really sort of eclectic topic amongst really sort of more mainstream topics. And so I could see people like some people getting up to walk out and like other people's faces like who is this chick get her off the stage. Um, And I'll admit it was it was a little discouraging for me. Um, And then so many people stopped me and talked to me to, to say positive things, which was great. Um, but then I got this email from someone Saturday night and she just went on and on about how brave it was to stand up there and talk about these things that people maybe weren't open to receiving and, and that she's now inspired as she's beginning her career to not be afraid to think outside the box and sort of look at all these different, um, you know, look at these different things and just to have an open mind as she begins her career and moves forward. And I just thought, man, that is freaking cool. Like if everybody were to get up and walk out of the room, like the way she had said that, you know, what I talked about this weekend sort of impacted her and her thought process was amazing. So very cool. All right. I know you've been, uh, one of your favorite new hobbies is, is, uh, is wine. So, uh, give us your favorite wine right now. Oh gosh. There's so many good ones right now. I am obsessed from a white standpoint with a 2013 Chardonnay from Hannah wineries up in, uh, right on the edge of Russian river Valley up there. Um, so I'm obsessed with that one. And then I've been studying Italian wine. So I'm super obsessed with just the Nebbiolo grape from Northern Italy right now in any form. Cool. What's your coolest wine experience so far? Um, probably the one that sort of introduced me to wine. I was with the Dodgers, um, and you know, I didn't go out very often with the guys, but every once in a while, especially when they said they were going wine tasting, I would join in. Um, and so I walked in, I was with three or four of the guys and and we were going to go wine tasting. One of the guys had a a wine, he he said it was like a wine bar or tasting room or something. So, um, so yeah, I, 
I went with them and we walked into this place in San Francisco and it literally looked like a convenience store. There was like mangoes and soup and like things in the window. <laughs> like it was, I'm thinking, where are we going? And we walk into the back of the room and there's this gigantic steel door. And so he opens the steel door and behind it is like literally a million dollars of wine. And they have every um, most amazing wine in the world that I, at the time, hadn't even known or heard of. And now, of course, I know and I've heard of them. Um, and so they were just tasting these amazing, different, awesome wines. And sort of that was my first, like, holy cow, there's more to wine than, you know, yeah. Zinfandel. Nice um, <laughs> intro. Nice intro. I love it. Yeah. And so it really sort of sparked my interest in wine. And, and that was really what kind of got me going in wine. So that was a pretty, pretty cool experience. Cool. Weirdest uh, or, you know, kind of funny experience with uh, Major League Baseball. Oh, goodness. I have so many of these, most of which I cannot share. In, <laughs> in <a laughs> like this. Uh, but, you know, one that I'm, I think of is a lot of the ballparks, especially the older ones, are not set up for women, for sure. You know, that just wasn't how they were set up. So whenever we were in Wrigley, now Wrigley has been remodeled and is different. But when I was there, um, there was no bathroom upstairs. And usually there's a bathroom in the manager's office. And, you know, Donnie would let me use that bathroom for some privacy, uh, which was really kind of him. Because um, I'm sure a lot of managers wouldn't want to share their bathroom. And so he's sort of always... Uh, you know, I'd always kind of just seek whatever private bathroom sort of down and around somewhere. Uh, and there's no bathroom like that in Wrigley Field, sort of where the guest, you know, the t um, uh, visiting team is. So I would have to go down in the middle of a game or pregame in my straight Dodger garb, go downstairs. I would go into like um, the Jack Daniels um bar, whatever the whiskey bar was that they have there in the patio. And I'd have to go in and stand in line in the concourse, basically, with all the Cubs fans. So I'm like standing there in like straight head to toe Dodger gear, because I'm working, obviously, and I'm standing in the bathroom line with all of these drunk Cubs fans, just because there's like no private bathroom for me. So that nice. was all like, there you go. man, I was like, gosh, dang it, I hate when I have to go to the bathroom. When I was at Wrigley Field. Um, really quick, most underrated fitness resource or lecturer that fit pros need to get to or see? Yeah. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, PubMed, <laughs> go to <Okay>. PubMed, <laughs> uh, which is really the peer reviewed journal source. Um, you know, that is where you're going to find your systematic reviews, your meta analyses, your true scientific research. That's going to tell you what you're doing is or isn't. I mean, you know, and I'm, and no, dissing any type of, um, you know, obviously podcasts like this are fantastic and, and all the availability we have to us on social media and sort of the availability everyone has to put their opinion out. Uh, but I think people need to remember everyone has the ability to put their opinion out and that may or may not be a great opinion. So I think sometimes in this day and age of social media and people getting all of their news and information off Twitter, uh, that you need to go to PubMed you know, go to the source, find some science. You can pretty much find science to support or refute anything you're doing. Uh, at this point, we have so much research, but, um, you know, that's really where I just think people need to be careful about their sources. And, and, and PubMed is one that I am often amazed that people don't really know how to use. All right. Uh, Sue, are you working on anything right now that's kind of getting you excited? Yeah, I'm working. I was just working on my book edits. <laughs> nice. I've got a book coming out. I said winter and now we're saying spring. So I'm hoping spring, late spring, uh, is when that book will be out. It's, it's called Bridging the Gap from Rehab to Performance. And we'll really sort of talk about how do we go from table to field, um, in my opinion. So yeah, I'm really cool. excited about that project. Right. Uh, Sue, let's finish up with uh, that letter to your younger self. Maybe something you would, uh, some advice you'd give to, uh, Little Sue in Boston, in, uh, in Buffalo. In Buffalo, yeah. Um, I, I think it would be uh, the, the two things I have tattooed on my fingers now as an adult, which is, are to be still and to be present. Um, I think my personality definitely can just get so wrapped up in planning and the future and what am I working on next and what do I have to do and where am I going and what's my next trip that sometimes I need to just be still, be present, 
um, take into account what's immediately around me and sort of not worry about what's next on my on my calendar. So uh, be present, be still, and breathe. Those would be my three things. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, cool. Sue, thanks so much for coming on. You're doing so many great things. You've been uh, an inspiration and an educator for so long in this business. Um, and uh, you're a pleasure to be around. So we really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Anthony. I appreciate it. I, I love this this concept of this shorter podcasting. It's great, and I appreciate you having me. All right. Well, that's going to do it for episode 22 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. Thanks again to Sue Falsoni for coming on. Make sure to check out all the links to all her stuff at stop20podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Leave us a review and a rating. It'll really help us out. My name's Anthony Rena. Thanks so much for stopping by. <laughs>